right, uh, everyone, now let me begin by wishing all the fathers and the fathers day, of course. It's always a special day and a special time. And when I stop and think about my own personal life, uh, probably one of the most important roles that I have played and that those of us who are men and fathers will ever play is your role as a father to your children. That's so incredibly important. How they turn out in life has a whole lot to do with your job that you do as a father. Amen. Sharing the gospel of the grace of God with them, teaching them the word of God, giving them Bible study uh, day in and day out. And as a dad, I have two daughters and now I have a stepson as well. Uh, but with my own children, we did Bible study every day. That was just a normal part of our life. They, they had food and a place to stay and their basic necessities. But I considered the Word of God a basic necessity. So we would pray together every day. We would do Bible study together every day. And I would share with them the right division. How to understand the Bible correctly. Amen? Amen. And it has had certainly an impact on their lives. Our message today is called The Potter and the clay. The potter and the clay. I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles to the Old Testament. We're going to look at several verses, beginning with Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 18. We're going to begin with chapter 18. So I'll give you a moment to turn there. Bible is divided up into Old Testament, the 13 letters of Paul, and also the New Testament. I like the way Paul explains as he lays it out in Ephesians. He says, we have times past, Old Testament, we have the but now, and we have the ages to come. So we're in the Old Testament for a minute here, and we're looking at chapter 18, Jeremiah <clears throat> Chapter 18. I think everyone's there. And I'm going to begin with verse 1. The word which came to Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a prophet, of course. And this is the word of the Lord. The word of Yahweh came to Jeremiah. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Arise! and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. So God is giving him instructions. He tells Jeremiah, why don't you go down to the potter's house? Do we know what a potter's house is? It's a place where they have the potter's wheel, where they make pottery, right? We know what pottery is. Uh, we had here in Syracuse, New York, where we live, a factory called Syracuse, China. It was there for more than, I think, a hundred years, right? It closed not too long ago. How unfortunate, right? But Syracuse, China has been around for a long time. And do you know that the perfecting of China on the wheel, we call it China because the Chinese were the ones who perfected the art of pottery. The Chinese were the ones that did that. Well, God tells the prophet Jeremiah to go down to the house of pottery. That would be Syracuse, China, right? If, if that were a local situation. Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. God's going to speak to him, but he wants him to wait until he gets to the potter's house. Then, well, Jeremiah is speaking, then I went down to the potter's house. He did what God told him to do. And behold, he, the potter, wrought a work on the wheel. So he's watching the potter as the potter is working with the clay. Verse 4, And the vessel that he made of clay was marred. There was a flaw. There was an imperfection in it. There was something wrong with what he had put together. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again. Another vessel. He starts over and he makes another vessel has seemed good to the potter to make of it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, Jeremiah, saying, O house of Israel, 
Notice what he does not say. He does not say, body of Christ. No. He says, O house of Israel. When you hear that expression, recognize that God is speaking directly, specifically, and exclusively to the house of Israel, of which we are not. Is there some application here for us? We'll see. Sometimes when God is speaking to Israel, there's no application for us. Sometimes there is some application for us. And I like to call that transdispensational truth. We'll see if that's the case as we keep reading here. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand, O house of Israel. So we have a very specific situation here where God is speaking specifically and directly to Israel. I'm going to ask you to turn now to the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah. And we're in chapter 64. Chapter 64, verse 8. Now, I'll give you a minute to get there. That is Isaiah, again in the Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah, chapter 64, verse 8. in Isaiah 64, verse 8. He says, But now, O Lord, Thou art our Father. Wow. God is also a Father. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that wonderful? Here it is Father's Day. And the Bible calls God our Father. Amen? Amen. He is our Father. He says, But now, O Lord, Thou art our Father. We are the clay and thou our potter. So in several places we're going to see God is called the potter. God is the potter. And we are the work of thy hands. Now he's speaking to Israel, of course. But there's, there's a truth here that, that expands beyond just the nation of Israel. Because when we're calling God the potter, we're calling him more than just a potter. What is that, by the way? calling God a potter. It's a metaphor. Now in the English language, and not just the English language, because all language has figures of speech, there are more than, or roughly somewhere around the neighborhood of 220 figures of speech. About 220 figures of speech. We've heard of a simile, a comparison that uses like or as. Metaphor. A comparison of two things God is being compared to a potter without using like or as. People directly say, you are this or you are that. Here God is called a potter directly. Let's turn also to Romans. Now we're in Pauline territory, the Pauline epistles. Turn to Romans chapter 9. I'm just going to put some verses out here, and then we're going to come back and we're going to address these, these words, these verses, teaching concerning God as the potter and nation of Israel specifically, but also, yes, us also as members of the body of Christ, as the clay. There's some universal truth here. Romans chapter 9, I'm beginning with verse 13. Paul is addressing Israel as well as the body of Christ. And he says, as it is written, Jacob, or Israel, have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Wow, God says he hates something here, someone here. We'll talk about that very shortly. Verse 14, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. So we're going to talk about this. Now, why would God say that I love one and I hate the other one? Why would he say such a thing? 
makes perfect sense if you want to see that shortly here. For he saith to Moses, remember for, introduces a purpose clause. Can you see that word for? He's about to explain what he just mentioned earlier. Paul asks the question in verse 14, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Of course not. That's impossible. But now he's going to give us the explanation. For he saith to Moses, but to God say to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Is this just the sovereignty of God alone? Is God being arbitrary? Is he saying I can like whoever I want to like and dislike whoever I want to like? I can save who I want to save and not save who I don't want to save? He's not saying that at all. We're going to, we're going to cover that and explain that shortly here. Hold up. Verse 16. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that shows mercy. For the scripture says unto Pharaoh, now here's our illustration. And this is going to help us to understand that God is not saying that he's arbitrary, that he loves one and he hates the other. He doesn't say, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, I like you, but I don't like you. I like this one, I don't like that one. He's not saying that at all. You might think that just with a simple, quick, cursory reading, but he's saying quite the opposite. When we look at the whole picture, and we have to look at the whole picture, God's integrity, God's person. What God says to us through the whole of Scripture, we need to see the whole picture and not grab one verse and pull it out of context. Well, we have an illustration here in verse 17. And again, he introduces the illustration with the word for. Purpose clause. He's introducing the purpose here. He says, the Scripture says unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up that I might now here's the reason why Pharaoh became Pharaoh. Here's the reason why Pharaoh was put into power. That I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. God used him. God has a right to use whoever he wants. He can raise you up, he can set, set you down. By the way, the Bible teaches us that when when a person is put in power, God is behind the people being in power by the way. I know we don't like some of the people that end up in power. Some people get upset because Donald Trump is the President of the United States. Some are very happy, some are very sad. But God is the one who puts people in power and God takes them out. He sets them up and He removes them. He put Nebuchadnezzar in power over Babylon. And then we think of evil rulers like Adolf Hitler. Did he put him in power? The Bible says you can't get in there unless God is behind it. God, is, God allows certain things to happen. Now, is it a good thing that certain people get into power? No, they do horrible things. They do great evil things. But even in their evil and even in their wickedness, God has a reason and God has a purpose. Do we always understand what that reason and purpose is? No, we do not. But God does have a reason and He does have a purpose. And we're going to get a little glimpse of this in this passage. Uh, verse uh, 18, he says, Therefore, he, he hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will harden. Verse 19, Thou will say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? So there is this age-old discussion about free will. Do we really have free will? Do we have free will? Or is God so much in control that we really don't have free will? That it's really just some kind of a facade. We have free will in this. We really do have free will. And we really do get to make our own decisions and our own choices. Does God know what decision you're going to make ahead of time? Of course He does. Does God approve of every decision you make? Of course He does not. Of course He does not. Well, let's take a look at this illustration before we keep reading with Pharaoh. When we read in the book of Exodus about Moses and God's dealing with, with Pharaoh, God says very specifically that He hardened Pharaoh's heart. Well, I've had some discussions with people over the years, 
that, that age-old question, do we really have free will? There's lots of groups out there, and there are Christians that think this way also, that think we really don't have free will. Right in our Friday night Bible study, we, we've had this ongoing discussion with one of the fellows in the Bible study who seems to think that we really don't have free will. You're not a robot. If you don't have free will, you're nothing more than a robot. When God says do this or don't do that, you have to exercise your free will to obey Him or to disobey Him. Now what about this verse where God says, I harden Pharaoh's heart? Let's talk about that for just a minute here. Did, did, did God harden Pharaoh's heart? Yes, He did. The question isn't whether God hardened his heart or not. The real question is, how did He harden Pharaoh's heart? God hardened Pharaoh's heart by telling him the truth. Do you know how your heart becomes hard? Your heart becomes hard when you hear the truth. When you hear the truth and you don't like what you hear, you get angry. When you hear the truth and you don't like the truth, you get upset. When someone tells you the truth about yourself, how do you react? Oh, you're, you're irritated. They ruined your day. <laughs> right? Oh, they ruined your day. And you're upset. And you don't want to talk to that person anymore. And you don't want to be around that person anymore. Why? Because they loved you enough and they were honest enough to tell you the truth. And what did you do? You hardened your heart. Now God could say he hardened your heart. How did he harden your heart? By telling you the truth. Sometimes wife will get upset with the husband. Why? Because he told her the truth. He told her the truth. Sometimes it's the other way around. The wife told the husband the truth and he didn't want to hear it. Plus he didn't feel like taking out the trash, right? Plus he didn't feel like cutting the grass. Plus he didn't feel like cleaning out the garage. She told him the truth and he got upset. Well, God told Pharaoh the truth. And what truth was it that God told Pharaoh? He told Pharaoh that I am that I am. I'm the real God. I'm the only God. Pharaoh worshipped all kinds of gods. They had the frog god. They had the god of the fleas. Every, every judgment that God put on Egypt addressed one of the fake gods, one of the false gods, one of the idolatrous gods that the Egyptians were worshipping. God set himself apart through Moses in the eyes of Israel, but also the Egyptians got an incredible witness by God. How did God harden Pharaoh's heart? He sent him Moses. Can you imagine such a witness having Moses come to you and talk to you and to share the word of God with you? What a hearing, what a blessing, what amazing grace and patience and kindness for him to give him the witness through Moses himself. That's how God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Did God love Pharaoh? Did God care about Pharaoh? He cares about everyone. And we learn that in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his own son, that whosoever believeth in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. He says God loves the whole world. He cares about the whole world. So what about this verse where he says, I love Jacob, but I hate Esau. He, he loved Jacob after Jacob became Israel. He's talking about salvation. He's the same person. He's, he's, in the, he's accepted in the beloved. If you're not accepted in the beloved, then you're cast out and cast away. That's a whole other discussion altogether. And, and when we see the word Esau, he's talking about a whole group of folks here who are going to be cut off because they hate God. They refuse to believe. They reject the message that comes to them. Whether that message came through Moses under the old program, whether that message comes today to the Edomites, to those descendants of Esau who are still here today, by the way. Right? And we know, and we know who they are. Does anyone know who they are? Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. They have their own country, countries. They have their own union, right? They have their own religion, by the way. They have their own God that they worship. And God hates that. He doesn't approve of that. And if, 
And if they continue in that way, they will be rejected by God. They're, they're under condemnation like every individual who enters this world except for Christ. How do we enter the world? We're born in Adam. In Adam we are under condemnation. We are separated from God. God. Jesus Christ came in the world and he paid for the sins of the world. People are shocked to hear this, but sin is no longer the issue. Sin is not the issue. And part of the confusion comes in because all these denominations that are out there preach sin, sin, sin. They keep talking about your sins all the time. And they have you trying to work to make yourself look better, right? To establish your own righteousness. God never accepts that. Doesn't accept that. The issue is Christ. What do you think about Christ? That's the real issue. And what do you think about the Scripture? What say of the Word of God? Do you listen to the Word of God? Are you willing to accept what God has to say? You do have free will. God expects you to exercise your free will. Well, let's take a look at another passage of Scripture. 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, one of Paul's letters, one of Paul's 13 letters. Paul wrote from Romans to Philemon. 2 Timothy is one of those 13 letters written by Paul. Take a look at 2 Timothy chapter, 20, uh, chapter 2, verse 20 and 21. We're still talking about this concept of the potter and the clay. God is sovereign. He doesn't have to answer to anyone. He's in charge. He's in control. He's the boss. Right? He's the one. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20 and 21. And Paul says, But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and of earth. Please pay attention close to this. And some to honor and some to dishonor. You know what he's telling us here? The potter is working. He's working on you. He's working on me. When he's finished with us, he would like for you to be a vessel of honor. What is a vessel of honor? A vessel of honor is a vessel that can be used for an honorable purpose. Have you ever had someone come over to your home? A guest. And what do you do when you have a guest? Maybe a special guest come to your home. You break out the good china. That's what you do. That's what you do, right? Oh, the ladies are smiling. They understand. Guys, we don't care. We use paper plates, right? <laughs> right? God, we're like cavemen. We don't care. We'll leave it off the table. We don't even think about it. We'll, we'll whip out the paper plate. But the ladies get this. They understand. They break out the good china. They break out the good silverware. Those are vessels of honor. And you show respect to your guests by breaking up the good china. Amen? Now, you also have some vessels of dishonor. That's the paper plate, by the way. Right? Even the paper plate has a function. If you're a member of the body of Christ and you're not growing spiritually, you don't care about the Bible. You don't care about Bible study. You don't care about growing up spiritually. You don't care about understanding and learning God's Word so that God can use you as a vessel of honor. Wow, you're, you're content to be a paper plate. Well, I'm here today to tell you, don't be satisfied with being a paper plate. No, oh, don't be satisfied. You ought to want to be something in the Lord. You ought to desire a reward from God, a blessing from God, a place of honor from God. You ought to want to be used by God. But you've got to grow in grace to get there. You've got to grow up spiritually. How do we grow up spiritually? By taking in God's Word. By showing up Wednesday night when Julius, Pastor Julius, is teaching the Word of God on Wednesday night. By showing up here on Sunday and taking in the Word of God. That's your spiritual food, by the way. And David said, I esteem, I consider God's word more important than my daily food. 
Oh, we don't miss food, do we? We eat three times a day. Some of us go off, right? We get, the, we get those three meals in, right? We don't show up to church. Here it is, after 12 o'clock, after 1 o'clock. We don't show up without eating. We get something in our stomach first. We don't miss breakfast. We don't miss lunch. Yeah. We don't miss dinner. Some of us don't miss a meal or two after that. What about the Word of God? What about your spiritual food? What about the spiritual man that's in you who is starving? Starving for truth. Starving for growth. That, that can only take place if you're sitting under the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit and right division. That's what has to take place for us. Verse 21, I'm in 2 Timothy, we're still looking at chapter 2. We just read verse 20, let's look at 21. If a man, therefore, purge himself. We know what it is to purge. We talk about uh, colon cleansing and getting ourselves uh, detoxed today. We hear a lot about being detoxed and flushed out and cleaned out. He uses this word purge. we got to clean ourselves out from what? If a man, therefore, purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel of honor. So he's talking about purging yourself from the wrong practice, the wrong thoughts, the wrong attitude. This attitude that I'm okay, I don't need to go to church, that's, we need to purge yourself of those thoughts. We, we need to flush that out. We do need to be here. We do need to sit under the teaching. We do need to participate. We do need God's blessing in our lives. We do need the Holy Spirit leading us and guiding us and directing us into all truth. That's what He does. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor. Sanctify. Oh, what a word. When I grew up and I heard that word sanctify, we thought that means losing your mind. We thought being sanctified means jumping around, right? Singing and dancing in church and rolling around in the aisle screaming, shouting and doing all the other stuff. Nothing wrong with praising God. Nothing wrong with singing and worshiping Him. Nothing wrong with that at all. But that's not what this word sanctified means. Sanctified, like the word holy, simply means to be set apart. That's all it means. If you're sanctified, and if you're in Christ, you are sanctified. It means to be set apart. Set apart for what? Set apart for the potter's use. He is the potter. We are, we are the potter. We need to be set apart for His use. God wants to use you. God has a plan for your life. Are you cooperating with God's plan for your life? You have to use your free will to do that. And with your free will, which you actually do have free will, it requires that you make a decision. Not just one decision, but many, 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 many decisions. Every Sunday, I decide, using my free will, that I'm coming to church, and that I'm going to be here when those doors open. I have a key, I'm here before the doors open, right? But you have to make a choice, you have to make a decision, you have to decide if you're going to be a vessel of honor which God can use in this life and in the next life. Because when we get to the judgment seat of Christ, and Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians, it sounds just like this verse. When we stand before Christ at the judgment seat, what's going to take place? He's going to take your works, your life, and He's going to, he's going to put it to the test. He talks about fire, purging. Testing, putting it, putting it to the test of fire. And if your life survives this, this testing, your works survive the fire, the quality of your service for God will be gold and silver and precious metals. You're going to receive a fantastic reward from God. But if you don't care about your spiritual life, if you're going to be a paper plate instead of China, wow. Your, your life is going to be wood, hay, and stubble. And the fire is going to burn up your reward. And you will feel ashamed. Will you be saved? Yes, of course. If you are a saved person, you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, let me explain what that means. What does that mean, a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ? 
What do you have to believe to actually be considered by God His child? God is our Father. Are you His child? Right? Have you been regenerated, born into His family? According to 1 Corinthians 15, this is the gospel. This is what you have to believe minimally. What's the least amount that I need to believe to know that I'm a saved person? To know that I'm going to be in God's presence one day as a saved, as a forgiven, as a cleansed person. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 6. We are to believe that Christ died on the cross to pay for our sins. That he, that he was buried and that He rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures, according to what the Bible says. Now, there's a lot of groups out there that have a lot to say about Jesus Christ. Some groups say, well, He didn't really die on the cross. Some groups say, well, He died on the cross, but He didn't pay for your sins. They say all kinds of silly, inaccurate things which are not in the Bible. We have to believe what the Bible says. The Bible is our standard. The Bible is the standard of truth. This is what we turn to for absolute truth, and it is absolute truth. And we can put our faith and our trust in the Word of God. And if we put our faith and our trust in anything other than God's words, we will be deceived. We will be open for deception. Amen. Well, he goes on, verse 21, let me read this one more time. And if a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. If you would be used by God, you need to be set apart for God. If you're going to be used by God, God has to prepare you. How, how, how does God prepare us? He prepares us through the ministry of God the Holy Spirit in conjunction with the Word of God. What changes your life? The Word of God changes your life. If you're taking in the Word of God as your daily food, your inner man, that spiritual person that you've become that lives in you, will grow strong in your understanding and in your walk with God. Amen? Amen. He is the power, and we are the clay. And as a lump of clay, Paul says that we are, we are to present ourselves to God a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Holy doesn't mean that you've never committed a sin. Holy doesn't mean that you don't struggle with a sin. Holy and that word sanctified are the same word. Holy means set apart for God. That's all it means. You're set apart for God. And if you're going to be set apart for God, folks, you've got to make yourself available to God. Are you available to God? Are you? You're here this morning, which is a good indication that you're available to God. I'm going to look next week to see if you're still available. Amen. 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 One more thing I'd like to bring you to is uh, a passage in Matthew. And I'd like to address uh, one more thing. We have this ongoing debate. This debate's been going on for like 4,000 years. We've got folks who talk about free will versus the sovereignty of God. There are people who believe we don't have free will. We don't really get to choose. We don't really get to make choices. It strikes me as being a very absurd argument, a ridiculous argument. Anytime you make a choice, you're responsible for your own choice. But you have people who think, well, I don't really control my own life. I don't really make my own choices, my own decisions. I don't really have free will. Well, I'd like to point out this particular verse. It's uh, Matthew chapter 23, verse 37. And we see this also in Luke. <clears throat> and Christ is speaking. And Jesus says in verse 37 of uh, Matthew 23, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, 
and stonest them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathers her chicks, her chickens, under her wings, and ye would not. You wouldn't allow it. You wouldn't do it. How can you not have free will if God is calling you and you're refusing to answer? God calls. He calls everyone. God, the Bible says that it's God's desire that everyone be saved. He's not willing that anyone should perish, but that everyone should come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. But you've got to ask yourself the question, if it's God's will for everyone to be saved, why isn't everyone saved? Why is it that many, 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 many people are, are lost? Who die lost, who never find out, who never find Christ? Why is it? They have free will. And they get to choose. They can, having heard the gospel, they can say, I accept that, I believe, and be saved. Or they can say, well, I don't believe that, I don't accept that. And we all know people who do not believe. We all know folks who reject the truth. Having heard the word of God, turn away and say, I don't want to hear that. I was in China for five years, and I remember teaching a specific class in English in reading, and the university gave me permission to share some information on the Bible in my reading class. Now in China, it's against the law. You really are not allowed to do that sort of thing. But the university, they liked me. <laughs> and they said, you know what, Mike? It's okay. Go ahead and share a little bit. Take a week, take two weeks, you can even take three weeks. That's what they told me. You can have three weeks. Share the Bible in your reading class for three weeks. Wow, I think I must have covered the whole Bible in three weeks. I got a lot of information squeezed into my little three weeks. But I remember, as I was sharing the Word of God, some of the students were very excited. They never heard this before. Some of the students were very angry. And by telling them the truth, I was hardening their hearts against God. One young Chinese girl jumped up in my class and she said, I don't believe what you're saying. I don't accept this. I calmed her down, sat her down and said, you're going to be tested on this information. I can't force you to believe anything, but you're going to at least be exposed to the information. One girl, very different from that girl, she also stood up and she sent a note. Kids had to send me some information and an assignment. She wrote right out her assignment. She said, there must be a God and I want more information. I want to know who this is. How do I find God? How do I understand more about Him? So, you hear the truth, it's going to do one of two things. It's either going to harden your heart or it's going to break your heart. Right? When you hear the truth that Jesus Christ went to the cross, suffered, bled, and died for you, for you personally, he was on that cross for six hours. And in that six hours, he reached a certain point where he drank the cup. Remember in the garden, he said, Father, let this cup pass from me. Not my will, thy will be done. What was that cup? That cup contained the sins of the world. It's a metaphor, a beautiful metaphor. But the reality is God imputed to Jesus Christ the sins of the world. And he was cut off from God the Father. And Jesus cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He felt forsaken because he was cut off from his Father while he was on that cross. And while he who knew no sin, he never sinned himself, but he came in contact with our sins. So here he is on the cross suffering, suffering terribly. And he's coming in contact with every sin. I'm mesmerized when I think about that because I realize, wow, while Christ is on the cross and he's dying, he had me personally in mind. This is a very personal thing for us. Every rotten thing you've ever done, ever done, every horrible sin you've ever committed, 
It was charged to his account. He paid for that. That's a personal thing. And when you hear the gospel of the grace of God, that Christ was on that cross and he died for you, that he was buried, and that he rose again from the dead, you need to believe. You need to respond. You need to respond. You need to believe. You can be saved today by simply believing that Christ died on the cross for you. He had you in mind personally. That he was buried. And that he rose again on the third day. That's the gospel of the grace of God. And the invitation has gone out to anyone and to everyone. Anyone who believes will be saved. Amen. God does all the work. God gets all the credit. What does he ask you to do? Believe. That's non-meritorious faith. You're not saved by good works. All the denominations teach good works. They say you got to go to Mass. you got to be catechized. you got to take communion. you got to tithe. you got to be water baptized. you got to, you got to, you got to, you got to. And the Bible says, no, you're saved by grace through faith. That not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's a free gift. My question to you today is, what will you do with Jesus Christ? Will you believe in Him? Will you trust Him for your salvation? Will you accept what He's done on your behalf, that free gift? Don't harden your heart when you hear the truth. Open your heart when you hear the truth. And receive the truth. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's close our eyes and bow our heads for a word of prayer. He is the potter, and we, like Adam in the very beginning, are the clay. Let God mold you. Let God make you into a vessel of honor today. Father, we praise you and thank you this Father's Day, a wonderful, wonderful day, a time of reflection to look back at uh, raising our children and looking forward to the children that we have yet to raise. Help us to raise them in the Lord. Help us to share the Word of God with them. Help us to be the kind of fathers that are well-pleasing to you. Help each and every one of us, male and female, to find Christ as our Savior, first and foremost, and to become vessels of honor that you can use here in this life and even in the next. Father, these things we pray in the precious name of your Son, our Lord, our God, our Savior, the head of the body, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.